Yes, Mr Hodge. Commissioner, the next witness is Ms Bly. Ms Bly, do you mind coming into the witness box? Can I ask you whether you would prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? An affirmation. Yes, affirm. Ms Bly, please. I solemnly and sincerely. I solemnly and sincerely. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth will be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Miss Bly. Do sit down. When I said sit down, I, <laughs> I thought the chair wasn't about to collapse under. It's just a long way down. <laughs> yes, Mr. Ms. Bly, could you tell the Royal Commission your full name, please? Anna Maria Bly. And your business address? Uh, 6 O'Connell Street, Sydney. And what is your present position? CEO of the Australian Banking Association. Um, it's correct that you received a summons to be here today and produce a witness statement? That's correct. And do you have a copy of that summons with you? Yes, I do. Um, I tender that summons, Commissioner. The summons will, to Ms. Bly will be Exhibit 3.143. And you've also signed a witness statement concerning rubric 320 dated 17 May 2018? That's correct. Um, do you have a correction to make in that regard? Yes, I do. Could I invite you to turn to page 22 of your statement? Yes. In particular, paragraph 105, little e, Roman 3, capital A. Yes, the sentence reads, only qualified practitioners would be appointed who are, who are, so we need to eliminate uh, one set of who are. Uh, then it says member banks. It should just say members. So member should have an S added to it and the word banks removed. Do you mind making the necessary amendments in handwriting and initialing them, please? Mm -hmm. Now that's been done, do you um, confirm that the contents of your statement are true and correct, to the best of your knowledge? Yes. Okay. Tender the statement, Commissioner. Exhibit 3.144 will be the statement of Ms. Bly. Together with a blend of uh, With its exhibits. Thank you. Yes. Yes, Mr. Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Ms Bly, you were appointed in February 2017 as the CEO of the Australian Banking Association? Yes, but I took the position up on the 3rd of April. All right. And that organisation used to be known as the Australian Bankers Association? That's correct. And the ABA has 24 member banks? That's correct. Present. And those members include the Commonwealth Bank of Australia? Yes. Westpac? Yes. NAB? Yes. ANZ? Correct. Bank of Queensland? Yes. And Suncorp? Yes. And one of the things that the ABA does, or perhaps the principal thing the ABA does, is to provide analysis, advice and advocacy for its member banks? That's correct. And the ABA has or has published for many years a code of banking practice? Correct. And the first version of the code was published in 1993? Yes. And the current code was published in 2013? Yes. And there's been various iterations of it over the years? Yes. And at present, the code is voluntary, is that right? Yes. If a member bank adopts it, the terms and conditions for that bank for all banking services and guarantees <coughs> will incorporate the relevant provisions of the code? That's right. And the ABA was given the responsibility of keeping the code up to date? Yes. And it undertakes various reviews for that purpose? Yes. And one of the reviews it undertook in 2016 was that done by Mr Curry? That's correct. He was appointed to undertake the independent review at that time? Yes. And that was done as part of 
what I think is referred to as the banking reform program, is that yes. right? And can you just explain to the Commissioner what the nature of that program was, as you understand it? The banking reform program? Yes. Uh, as you will um, understand, I was not in the position at the time that the program was developed, but my understanding of the program uh, is that it was a set of initiatives uh, designed uh, by the industry, the banking industry, uh, to, be, to take up issues that had been expressed uh, of community concern by customers, uh, by commentators, uh, and in some cases, elected representatives. It had a number of initiatives. The decision to review the code uh, was one of those, and that decision brought forward the normal review of the code by about two years. Uh, it also included a um, it also included a review by Stephen Sedgwick of remuneration and incentives uh, and how that might be um, uh, improved. It had a number of other elements, uh, the introduction of customer advocates in banks, the uh, revision of the whistleblower guidelines uh, and a number of other uh, commitments that were all designed to rebuild trust in Australian banking. Now, Mr Curry completed his review in January of 2017? Yes. So, uh, and that was just, well, it was before you started up your current role? That's correct. And I should say, I, I think the final report of Mr Curry was provided, I think, on the 7th of February. Yes. But, but around that time. And <coughs> what Mr Curry proposed were a number of revisions to the code, and in fact, a complete rewriting of the language of the code. Yes. And... Following his recommendations, the ABA went about preparing a revised version of the code. Yes. What is, I think it's fair to say, a complete rewriting of the code as it was. Yes. And you've exhibited that, the current proposed version of the code to your statement? Yes. And that's also now recently been published on the ABA's website? That's correct. And the ABA is seeking the approval of ASIC for the code? Yes. And as we understand it, the ABA hasn't previously sought ASIC approval for the code? That's correct. And do you know why the decision has been made now to seek approval of the code? Uh, as I indicated, I wasn't uh, there at the time this decision was made, but the uh, documents uh, indicate that the industry was giving consideration to uh, submitting the code for ASIC approval uh, for over a number of months in the, during and after Mr Curry's report. Uh, and that the considerations were uh, that providing the code uh, or submitting it to a body outside of the industry, in this case a regulator, uh, may well add uh, public reassurance that this code uh, was a code that would be of benefit to customers, that it had been assessed and that it had been developed in accordance with uh, the appropriate regulatory guidelines. And as we understand it then, the code was rewritten and sub submitted to ASIC in December of last year? That's correct. And there's been some communications between the ABA and ASIC over the drafting of the code since then? Yes. And there's a revised, revised version of the code that you've also exhibited to your statement from, I think, April of 2018? Yes. All right. And what I'd like to do is to go through some of the parts of the code, there are really five issues that I want to take you through to understand the position of the ABA at this point in time on those issues. So the first one is the definition of small business. And if we bring up exhibit four, which is ABA.001.008.0434, I, if you want to work off your paper copy, no, I'm happy to. Light. So this is this is that April 2018 version that we were referring to a moment ago, and this is a track changes version, which just shows the changes that have been made as between this version and the original version in to, at the end of 2017. Can we go to page .0443? And so we see what the... I'm sorry, Mr Hodge, I think I will need to look at uh, the documents. Um, you don't know which tab that's yes, at, Yes, it's tab four. 
this block. And we're on page? Page five. Yes. So this is the current proposed definition that is proposed by the ABA. And there's a few aspects of it that I want to ask you about, but I think we might start with the monetary limit, which is, you'll see subparagraph C. So a business is a small business <laughs> if at the time it obtains the banking service it has less than $3 million total debt to all credit providers. That's what the ABA is currently proposing. Yes. And as you know, the recommendation that had been made by Mr. Curry was that the definition of small business extend to $3 million, I'm sorry, extend to $5 million, not $5 million of total debt, but $5 million in relation to the particular loan. That's what you That's understand correct. to be his recommendation. And as we understand it, this is a this debate over the definition of small business remains a point of contention between the ABA and ASIC, is that That's right? That's correct. And just so we can understand, can I get you to help the Commissioner to understand the issues that the ABA and its member banks see with a definition that extends, say, all the way to Mr Curry's definition of $5 million for the loan itself. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, it, is, um, it is the case that this is an issue that has been uh, very carefully deliberated on by banks over the last 12 months and has been the subject of extensive discussions with um, a number of stakeholders and those discussions continue now with ASIC. This uh, part of the definition uh, is the threshold that must be uh, met for small businesses or businesses to uh, gain the protections and entitlements of a new section of the code that goes to uh, new arrangements for small businesses, particularly in relation to uh, simpler standard contracts and the use or otherwise of certain non-monetary defaults. So I think regardless of who the stakeholders are in this, there is, including in the industry, there is agreement that there are a category of small businesses who by the nature of their size, generally very small businesses, are more appropriately dealt with um, as almost as retail customers, if you like. And that there are conversely a group of businesses that are large, capable, successful, commercially um, you know, capable uh, and would be generally referred to as sophisticated borrowers. This is an effort to find, I mean, everyone I think accepts the two ends. This is an effort to find where is the appropriate middle? Uh, where is the line to be drawn that defines an unsophisticated borrower from a sophisticated borrower? Banks are very, uh, they're cautious and wary about extending these provisions beyond uh, the current um, unfair contract laws, which generally these provisions are tackled in contracts, sorry, not contracts, loans of one million or less. This will extend it to three million. Uh, banks in making a determination about managing their loan book have to take on more risk in taking on a small business loan. And they feel, they feel they, they still feel a little uncomfortable, I would say, at the three million, but they are willing to go to that. They feel distinct, un, distinctly uncomfortable at the five million. And that is more true of uh, some of the um, non-major banks or banks that are um, smaller regional Australian banks who have smaller loan books who feel that not only will they be exposed to a higher degree of risk with such contracts, uh, but that because of the size of their loan book, that will put them, and the nature of their loan book, that will put them at a competitive disadvantage against the four major banks. So what we're trying to do here is find a minimum standard that suits all of the industry, regardless of the nature of their business and the size of their loan book. Uh, but there is a debate. A, there are a number of stakeholders who obviously, for, I think understandably, want to pr extend these protections as far as they can, and banks are erring on the side of caution uh, and uh, you know, conservatism. You will 
probably all have also have seen in the papers that the banks have indicated to ASIC uh, that part of their conservatism on this is that, uh, frankly, we're in uncharted waters. They haven't lo made loans of this size for in these circumstances before, and they would be open to uh, a two-year three. If, if th that uh, put it at three million. Try that for two years, have a review supervised by ASIC with a view to rising it to five if uh, some of their concerns are not realised. What I'd like to do is just take a few of those points in turn so that the Commissioner can get a better sense of what the issues are. Can I start with the idea that the code creates a higher risk for the banks in respect of the loan. Can you just explain that further to the Commissioner? What is the additional risk that it imposes for the bank? Okay. Um, small business loans, uh, when it comes to banks doing their credit risk assessments, small business loans under APRA guidelines attract a higher risk assessment than uh, a mortgage, for example. Uh, and for banks that have high exposures, to small businesses or particularly to certain sectors, uh, they have to manage that risk on their loan book. They, f particularly the non-major banks, feel that that's, there's already a hurdle there in moving into business lending, simply because of the fact that the risk rating is higher for their banks than for, non for, than for the four large banks. And I might need to unpack that for you. I'm not sure whether there's been a discussion in, about standardised credit risk. No, or... I think that would be helpful if you can... You, okay. What you want to unpack is the issue about the way in which APRA risk weights yes. particular assets. Is yes. that right? I think that would be helpful okay. for the Commissioner. So there are two, uh, two ways that APRA provides for um, risk weights to be calculated. One is through what's called a standardised method and the other is through an internal rating uh, method. And the um, standardised... Sorry... So the internal rating is known as IRB. Uh, for a bank to qualify to use an internal risk rating and become an IRB bank, uh, they need the approval of APRA and APRA will only give that approval where the bank is able to demonstrate a very deep capability and sophisticated uh, assessment of, um, of risk in their lending practice. The four major banks are IRB banks. Uh, Macquarie Bank recently was approved and ING will start in July as an IRB bank. All of the other lending banks in Australia are required to use the standardised method. So using the standardised method, uh, banks are required to allocate 100% risk to a small business loan. If you are an IRB bank, you can... Uh, look at the loans in much more granular detail because of the capability that you have and you can risk rate them accordingly. And what you will find is most, on average, the IRB banks, uh, their risk rating on most on small business loans averages somewhere around 50 to 60%. So that means that there's quite a gap in the risk rating between the IRB and the standardised banks. So that's one issue. Um, for some of the banks in the industry that do not have large lending books, uh, there is not a lot, if any, lending to business that they do um, beyond five million. They might have one or two loans beyond five million, but for some of the uh, smaller regional banks, their loan book uh, gets very, five million takes them very close to their total business lending book. And they are very concerned about the prospect of having almost an entire loan book in their business uh, lending that has significantly lower controls uh, as proposed in the code than they currently have in their business book. So they feel they have almost two hurdles now, they, that they would in this circumstance have two hurdles. Sorry, did you want to... No, I have some questions that I just want to use to try to break this down. So I think we understand the idea that APRA uses two... Depending on the bank, there are two different available methods in relation to the, in relation to the risk weighting that it attracts or attaches to a small business loan. And 
as I understand what you're saying, the point you're making is for an IRB bank of which there will by July be six in Australia, those six banks are able to allocate a risk weighting to small business loans that effectively depends on their internal analytics in relation to the risks that attach to those particular loans. That's the first point that yes. you're making. And the second point that you're making is that for all other banks or ADIs that are operating in Australia, when they come to allocate a risk weighting to a, any loan, they have to do so according to whatever are the standardised ratings that APRA sets in its yes. guidance. And you made the point in relation to a small business loan that the risk weighting under the APRA standard guidance is 100%. That's right? That's right. But there's a slight... There's a bit more detail, isn't there, about that, which is, as we understand it, if the small business loan is secured by a residence, then it's treated in the same way as a residential mortgage. Is that right? Uh, it depends a little on the nature of the security. But, yes, I, I should have indicated that uh, it's um, it, more in the unsecured area that 100% that applies. And if it's... or Sorry, unsecured, not secured on a residence. It might, for example, if it's secured over commercial property, then there might be a particular risk weighting that applies in relation to that. Different from what would happen if it was secured over a residential mortgage. Yes, but I think the important thing here is that there would be very few, uh, well, the bank's view is that there would be very few small businesses that are truly small businesses that would have residential property and to the value of $5 million. I understand. And then is there a difference at the moment in how APRA applies a risk rating to a loan for a business under five million, to a loan of under five million dollars to a business as distinct to a loan of more than five million dollars no. for a business. All no. right. So not my understanding. So the the monetary threshold as it stands makes no difference to what the risk weighting is that APRA applies to a no, business. That's loan. right. All right. And so then the point that you're making, I think, must have a further step, which is some concern that if the code comes into effect in the form that it presently is, but with a cap of $5 million, that that might have some effect on the standardised risk weighting? No. Maybe if I can be a bit mm -hmm. clearer. Those banks that are subject to the standardised risk weighting already feel at some competitive disadvantage. And given that they have smaller loan books, uh, m in most cases where taking it to 5 million would take it very close to 98 or 99 per cent of their business lending book, uh, that means that their, almost their entire book would be subject to significantly less control of the, the loan than is currently the case. So they feel they would have a double competitive disadvantage in the small business lending area. So I, I don't mean to conflate the two, it's more that they are the two different things, but together they present a competitive disadvantage to standardised banks, partly because of the fact they're standardised and partly because of the fact that they are, their lending books are smaller and slightly different. I understand. I think, let me say it back to you to make sure that we've nailed it down for the purposes of the evidence. For banks that are not one of the IRB banks, which is every bank except for the major four plus Macquarie now, soon to be ING. So for every bank other than those six, they already have a view, which is they are presently under a competitive disadvantage when compared to the IRB banks because they are required to have a higher risk weighting on, on any business loan unsecured by a residence when compared with an IRB bank. Is yes, that right? Yes, yes. So there already exists, independent of whatever form the code is in, that disadvantage? Yes. And the concern is that the disadvantage that they might be under will be further compounded if the code comes into effect and applies to loans of up to $5 million for That's small correct. business. And the reason that it might be further compounded is because for those non-IRB banks, 
many of them have business portfolios that are largely comprised of loans of $5 million or less. That's correct. So that they expect that the effect of the code will be felt on a higher proportion of their business loans when compared to the proportion of business loans that it will affect for the major banks. That's correct, and that in turn affects that their, their risk appetite when looked across the whole book. Uh, yeah, no, that's sorry, right. did you want to... <laughs> no, I'm sure going we'll going get to it. it. <laughs> All right, and so then when it comes to the way in which it would affect them, the point is that it would impose what you described as significantly lower controls on the loans, is that right? Yes. And can you explain to the Commissioner what you mean by that, why it is that the code would impose significantly lower controls? Yes. Uh, so previous versions of the code have not uh, expressly applied uh, to small businesses. There have been one or two provisions that a small business has been able to access uh, some entitlement or, or protection. But this is the first time that the code has taken on an entire small business chapter and provides a number of um, new uh, protections to small business. And it's they're protections that, if you go back to my earlier comment about the spectrum of from unsophisticated to sophisticated, they're protections that will make small business contracts look a little more like um, a, a unsecured personal loan, for example. So, for example, uh, it limits non-monetary... Uh, the code provisions will limit uh, for these small businesses, however defined, uh, will limit non-monetary defaults uh, to those uh, that go really to the lawful operation of the business. Uh, it will not apply uh, financial indicators other than in the case of property development and specialised lending. Uh, it, will own, it will not have material adverse um, circumstances or material adverse change as a default trigger. It will have it... It may be in a standard contract as a review, a review trigger for a business where the bank believes that there's difficulties arising, but it will remove material adverse change as a general default trigger. So the protections, um, I think, there's this, well, there's, what this does is shift some of the risk from the customer to the bank. And that's in recognition that in small businesses, as I said, we're looking at trying to identify which or how do you define those customers that, who are truly in the unsophisticated category. Banks are of the view, and, and, and their view is based on their experience of their lending, that once a business gets into the four and five million dollar category, they become, uh, one, if they're in the business of borrowing that sort of money, then they're more likely to be of a more sophisticated nature and able to access both commercial and legal advice. So, and again, we might just try to take this in steps. When you're talking about the significantly lower controls, it sounded to me like the types of controls you're talking about are limitations on the ability of banks to enforce or take default-based action. Are those the types of controls you're talking about? Yes. So, mindful that these are on um, business loans that are not secured, so uh, or not fully secured. Where you would want the where banks are seeking to make sure they have some ability to intervene when there is evidence that the business is not doing well, um, either to work with the business to restructure or where nothing else um, will work, uh, to intervene to uh, end the loan if the bank is of the view that doing so is the only way to stop the business from going further downhill. And. I think that's effectively a yes to my question. What I'm concerned to distinguish between is there are certain obligations that apply in relation to the making of a loan in the first place, the diligent and prudent yes. banker standard. So that's about the start of the loan. And then there are parts of the code that deal with what can happen at 
the end of the loan or the potential end of the loan and the limitations on the ability of a bank to take default-based action. So those are two separate things. Correct. Both of them might be described as a control on what it is that the bank can do, but I understand the type of control that you're referring to are the controls at the end of the loan. That is the ability to take default-based action, the ability to appoint IAs, the ability perhaps to appoint receivers and managers and restrictions on whether you can use the same person, that type of thing. Yes, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say there's a complete distinction between the beginning and the end. Uh, when banks are making a decision about uh, making a lending decision, they have obligations to ensure that there are sufficient provisions in the contract to allow them to... It's a risk assessment. Is there enough provisions in this contract for me to make this loan and know that there is an opportunity to manage that loan if needs be. And, and just on that, which is an interesting point, and I'd like to just focus on it for a moment, is it fair to say the point you're making is if a bank has to act as a diligent and prudent banker, then one of the things it has to take into consideration in determining whether or not to make a loan uh, what are the risk mitigation controls or powers that it would have in the event that there was a drop in the value of a security or some change in circumstances? Yes. And so that on the one hand, it might seem beneficial to a borrower to have this particular contractual standard, which is that the banker has to act or the bank has to act as a due and a prudent and diligent banker in making the loan, but on the other hand, because the controls available to a bank governed by the code will be less, that might actually make it less likely that the bank would be prepared to extend credit. Yes. There and is a policy tension between those two. I understand. And then if we then just move back to this issue of the distinction between three and five million dollars, the Taking your point about the competitive disadvantage for smaller banks, on this premise, presumably, the smaller banks are going to be competitively disadvantaged for loans under $3 million. Is that right? I'm sorry, could you just repeat that? Well, if the premise is that for any loan that is governed by the code, a, a bank that is not an IRB bank will be at a competitive disadvantage or a further competitive disadvantage, that would mean that under the current draft, if it applies to loans of $3 million or less, those non-IRB banks will be at a competitive disadvantage in relation to those loans. That's correct. And, and they're seeking to contract, contain that. They're seeking to have it not extend up to yes. loans of $3 million or more. But also, there's another quirk here, which is it's not actually... It's not actually even following the form of the recommendation that was made by Koori, which is that you judge it based on the size of the loan. Mm. Instead, it's being judged based on the size of the total debt to all credit providers. That You agree with that? Yes. So that the consequence is that for any loan where that particular borrower has total debt to whatever other credit providers there might be, that particular loan won't be covered by the code. That's, that's how it right, works. that's correct. And so that may make it even more difficult to figure out the extent of the competitive disadvantage to the smaller banks. But your fundamental point is that to whatever loans the code applies, small banks, that is non IRB banks, will be at a competitive disadvantage in relation to those loans. That is one of the concerns that is uh, informing the industry's uh, position. Yes, correct. So that what might, assuming that was, that proved to be accurate, and assuming that those non-IRB banks didn't want to be at a competitive disadvantage, their only option would be to leave the ABA. Is that right? 
That could be, or yes, that could be one option. And at the moment for those non-IRB banks, have they given an indication to you of what proportion of their business loan book is falls into the $3 million or less category? Uh, yes, um, and there is a document among all of this, but it, it varies from bank to bank, but uh, somewhere between 93% up to 98% uh, across each across the entire industry. And that includes both the IRB and the non-IRB yes. banks? And that would mean, assuming it was at a minimum 93%, that on this thesis of competitive disadvantage, the non-IRB banks are in any event going to be competitively disadvantaged in relation to 93% of business loans. Is that right? Yes, but I think it's important to understand that uh, the vast majority of small business loans are well below a million dollars. Uh, most recent RBA data, I think, is, it indicates that some 90% of business loans are under $500,000. So when, an, uh, when a standard bank, a standard um, risk assessment bank, is making a judgment on the risk of a $100,000 or a $200,000 loan, uh, where the, the question of the amount of either security and or uh, control mechanisms or um, risk management mechanisms is a vastly different decision uh, than one that relates to a loan of three million, four million or five million. And it, it, it's, it goes directly to the question of risk appetite. We might, we'll come to that in a moment. I just... I want to make sure that we've fully understand, understood the ABA's point about competitive disadvantage. The code will apply to whoever is a member of the ABA. That's right, isn't it? Uh, the code, um, when, when a bank signs up to the code, it applies to them completely. Any non-signatory banks... Uh, if there was a dispute uh, that uh, came before the Ombudsman, the Ombudsman would use the code as the benchmark for best practice in determining a matter. So whether or not a bank is a signatory or whether or not they're a member of the ABA, uh, the code still sets the industry standard and is used by the Financial Ombudsman uh, to determine the benchmark against, a matter should be, against which a matter should be considered. All right. So Absolutely. it may not be strictly enforceable in a court if they're not a signatory, but in the ombudsman service where most disputes are resolved, it would it does apply. I had thought perhaps I'd misunderstood that the ABA was now going to require any member bank to sign up to the new code once it came into yes. effect. So, but non-member banks who are not yeah. signatories, um, or if, going back to your hypothesis about a bank that left, it would not necessarily... That's right. absolve them of the responsibility. So if we just sort of work through this idea of competitive disadvantage, any, any member bank of the ABA will have to sign up to the code, that's right? Yes. And Sorry, any member bank who provides retail services to which the code applies. Yes, yes. we'll have to sign yep. up to the code. And that the application of the code doesn't depend on whether you're an IRB bank or a non-IRB bank? No. So that the disadvantage that any bank experiences in relation to a loan to which the code applies is the same regardless of what bank it is? Insofar as yes. the disadvantage arises from yes. the code. So that it seems like any disadvantage that the non-IRB banks might suffer when compared to the IRB banks isn't connected to the code, it's just connected to the APRA risk weighting? No. Uh, for those, as I said, these two things are not um, totally connected. It's more that one compounds the other. So it's, if you are a non-IRB bank, uh, it's largely because you are not as big not as your, your um, risk, um, credit risk assessment capability is not yet as deep and as granular. And by virtue of that, you're almost likely you're going to be a smaller bank with a smaller loan book. Uh, and your risk appetite is going to be 
uh, generally lower than uh, banks that are significantly larger. Is so there, maybe if I... I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just if I try to cut to what I think is the issue that we're trying to get at here, is the issue that if if a bank has a greater percentage of its loans, of its business loans, falling within the ambit of the code, that that might somehow create yes. a disadvantage as compared to a bank that has less of its loans falling within the ambit of the code? Yes. And why does that create a disadvantage? Because each bank will have to make a determination on each loan uh, about the provisions in that contract for managing the risk that, is, uh, that comes with that form of lending. And if that makes up almost all of your loan book, then your appetite for taking on very significant loans of three and a half, four, five million for, again, the customers we're trying to protect here, uh, is going to be significantly lower than if you have a very extended loan book and those loans that are riskier because they have less risk controls in them, they form, you know, significantly lower part of your book. I might just move to a slightly related issue, which is you made a point about the sophistication of borrowers and that the banks believe that if the total debt is greater than $3 million, that the borrowers are likely to be of a different level of sophistication to borrowers with a debt of less than $3 million. That was what I understood your point to be, is that right? They're more likely to be more complex businesses. They are less likely to be secured by residential or other property, simply because of the size of the loan. Uh, they are in the experience, and you know, banks have advised me that their experience is once they start getting into that territory, they are dealing with a, a, a you know, more complex um, and, and more mature businesses. Uh, this is not to say that there aren't some unsophisticated borrowers in that category. As I said earlier, what banks are trying to do here is find a definitional threshold which in the first instance, given that this is actually un quite uncharted water, is careful, cautious and conservative. Is there, is there some data analysis that the banks have done to come to the view that $3 million of total debt represents roughly the point when you expect more sophisticated borrowers to be on the other side of that marker? Uh, ba banks have um, advised, they've come to this position by talking to the people within their own banks about uh, those people who run their lending books, um, about the nature of small businesses that are in this sort of lending category. Uh, but I don't want to overstate that. Uh, it is precisely because there isn't a lot of data on this. There isn't, it's not so much data, it's actually a lot of, lot of experience at managing covenant light contracts and what that might do in the longer term to risk appetite, to access to credit and to the cost of credit. Uh, it is likely that, you know, so banks are concerned that they, the lighter the covenants, the more likely they are to have to price in the cost of that increased risk they're taking or be less likely to want to take on the loan. Uh, now, nobody can absolutely predict exactly what will happen, but it's precisely, but it's that concern that is driving them to the more cautious end of the spectrum in the first instance uh, with a view that they are open to going to a higher level um, within a two-year period if their data, if they can have a look at actual data with the experience of running those contracts and whether it has actually uh, in the end played out in a way that put risk appetite, um, or made risk appetite play out in a way that made access to credit tighter. You know... I'm sure that the assessment that Mr. Curry made was that $5 million was about the right level and that was based on his experience with having previously reviewed the FOS system and looking at the complexity of loans that were being dealt with by FOS. That's your understanding of his approach? Uh, yes, I have uh, looked at the reference um, to that FOS review uh, there is one line that refers to uh, having seen 
evidence of businesses over five million seeking to use FOS uh, services and that that didn't seem appropriate. Uh, that was a review done to determine what is the appropriate way to define a small business uh, in terms of their eligibility to receive external dispute resolution services. Uh, one of the concerns the banks have is that um, that threshold, that is, what is the hurdle you have to jump to get ex uh, access to uh, external dispute resolution is being transferred to um, credit risk assessment and lending practice without any real science under it. I understand. And the the way in which Mr Curry has approached or approached it in the FOS case and then approached it carrying over to his review of the code was that based on his observations, he thought $5 million represented a rough threshold for when the complexity of the loan and therefore the potential dispute increased beyond something that could be expected to be dealt with in a simple way. That was, it was about the complexity of the loan and therefore the dispute, I think it's fair to say. Yes. And is the ABA's concern or the member bank's concern that you shouldn't consider the complexity of the loan and therefore the possibility of the complexity of the dispute. You should judge it based on something else to do with the borrower? Not entirely. The uh, views of the banks have consistently been that you, the, the more you go up the lending ladder, uh, the more, as a general rule, there will always be exceptions, but as a general rule, the more complex the business and the more complex the nature of the loan and the more complex um, the contractual arrangements become. Uh, and their view is that in the first instance it would be prudent in extending uh, in effect the unfair contracts legislation um, from one million it would be more prudent and cautious based on their experience of the lending judgments they make for the threshold to be three million. Uh, beyond that in their view uh, you start entering some quite complex territory. Can I throw out an idea and see whether you want to adopt it or not? Is it possible that what the banks are concerned about is the sophistication of the borrower as distinct from the complexity of the loan arrangement or the possible dispute that would arise from the loan arrangement? No, to the contrary, I think they're worried. Those two things are related. You know, generally, when you're into a complex business, it's unlikely to be your first foray into uh, into into that field. Let, let me let me put it again, and you don't have to adopt it. But it's possible that you might well have a situation where, if you're borrowing a total amount of money of greater than three million dollars you are a sophisticated borrower, even though the particular loan contracts that you are using are going to be standardised, what appear to be relatively simple loan contracts. That is, there is a significant distinction between, or possible distinction between the sophistication of the borrower and the complexity of the loan arrangement. I'm sorry, I'm that, still not quite clear what it is you're putting to me. That's right. I, I was just trying to offer an idea, that, an argument that I thought <laughs> might help the ABA. But uh, can I move on to... I'll go back and read it in the transcript. <laughs> yes. Can I move on to uh, the next topic I wanted to ask about, which is guarantees. Can we bring up ABA.001.008.0460? I think I've gone too far. Can we go back to 0458? What I'm interested in exploring with you is this second issue, Ms Bly, is in relation to clause 99 of the proposed code, which is guarantee documents, which sets out the documents that the 
member bank is agreeing to give to the guarantor in relation to the borrower. Mm -hmm. And what I mean, and this may, this doesn't seem to have been a point of dispute with ASIC, so it may be that it's not something that you're able to assist us with. What I'm interested in understanding is the bank's view about the adequacy of this information in assisting a guarantor to make a determination as to whether they ought to give a guarantee? Well, clearly all of the uh, provisions of the code represent um, the standard that banks can agree by consensus um, you know, is a reasonable standard. I suppose the... I should say it is a minimum standard as well. Of course, it's, mm. it's a minimum standard. Yeah. It may be that I'm... This might be something I'll take up with ASIC tomorrow and then they can decide whether they want to then take it up with you in your ongoing negotiations. Can I move then to the third issue that I want to talk about, which is non-monetary defaults? Can we go to 0455? So this begins a series of clauses whereby the banks are making certain commitments in relation to the circumstances in which they'll take enforcement action based on non-monetary defaults. Correct. And this is the particular, as I understood it, one of the principal areas of concern in terms of imposing greater controls on the banks that they might otherwise not be subject to. Correct. And one of the complaints that Mr. Curry made about the drafting of Clause 80 is that what he was trying to suggest was the bank ought to be very specific about the exact circumstances in which it will exercise non -default, or take default-based action for non-monetary defaults and that this drafting as it is doesn't achieve that aim and that instead what happens is Clause 80 says we won't do it unless, and then there are a whole series, 12 exceptions to the circumstances in which they won't do it, and then there's just the further qualification of Clause 83, which is the material impact clause. And I'm interested in understanding the bank's view about the adequacy or otherwise of these controls. Uh, clearly, uh, there are many reasons why a small business or any business may get into financial problems uh, and they, the list, given the vast diversity of the kinds of businesses that are the subject of bank lending, if, I think you're suggesting Mr Curry should have said, it indicates it would have been preferable to have a list of the circumstances in which it would happen. Yeah. Uh, I think you'll find that would list go to several hundred pages. Um, if you think about all of the things that might happen, uh, what is being indicated here is that there are only... The, and if you look at those 12, they really do go largely to the lawful operation of the business, that uh, financial indicators such as um, using LVR will not be a trigger for default, except, as I said, in relation to property development. Uh, so if you're insolvent... I mean, they're very clear, I think... Um, and it must follow from the things you were saying earlier that the banks regard this as a, these clauses as significantly constraining their rights. Is that right? I think it would be a judgment for each bank about the significance that these might. Um, it, it, it's more that they're less. There are less now, significantly less than there were in previous contracts. And they are restricted to those things that go to the lawful operation of the business uh, and, uh, and with the provision that it has to be material. Uh, and in the absence of some of the previous mechanisms, this is um, what's been called a covenant light contract. The reason I say it must be that they regard it generally as significant is because if the 
premise of the objection to the cap being extended to $5 million is that the bank will then, I think to use your term, have significantly lower controls in respect of any loans to which the mm. code applies. It must follow that this significantly reduces the controls that they would otherwise have. Yes. All right. And can you just explain to the commissioner, uh, is the reason for that the combination of both the fact that there are now only certain circumstances, the 12 listed, in which the default-based action can be taken and also because of the requirement in 83 that there be a material impact? Yes. Uh, it, previously, these contracts could include as a default trigger uh, a clause, a generalised clause um, along the lines of any material adverse change. That now cannot be used as a default trigger for these contracts. And when I said before the sorts of multiplicity of things that might be caught in a material adverse change clause, you know, all kinds of things about what might happen to your business that uh, is not possible to predict. Um, that no longer exists, so that's a risk that the bank is taking, that there may be, outside of these 12, there may be something that is material, it is adverse, and it puts the business at risk, and the bank does not have um, a... A, a direct entitlement to take action for that reason. So that is a transfer of the risk to the bank from the customer to the bank. Uh, there are it also, Clause 85, um, the only financial indicator covenants, and these are the covenants which go to the use of um, LVR, for example. Uh, they can only be used in the case of um, property development lending or loans for specialised lending transactions such as margin lending, um, self-managed super funds and other um, such instruments. So those financial indicators were also something that banks have in the past relied upon and they will no longer be part of a standard small business contract except in those limited circumstances. So again, that is a transfer of risk to the bank. Is it really though, if we think about some of the case studies that we've seen where there have been issues about default, they have tended to, well, non-monetary default, they've tended to involve either a failure to provide financial information in accordance with whatever the contractual causes are, or a failure to comply with whatever the particular financial indicator covenants are. Now, it may be that there's a raft of cases where there's just a generalised exercise of material adverse change clauses. But if we set that possibility aside for one moment, the financial information carve out remains in AD subparagraph H. Yes. So that if the bank puts in a clause that requires quarterly statements to be provided, then that is something upon which it can take default-based action, subject to 83? Well, uh, only if it's not provided as um, part of the contract uh, and if, it's, if the failure to provide it is um, demonstrably uh, material. And the, but the financial indicator covenants are removed except for specialised loans? That's right, and property development lending. And is that really the more significant point, that there's the removal of financial indicator covenants will at least restrict the circumstances in which, say, a business that's borrowed on the basis that it's buying... A, I'm sorry, a person that's borrowed money in order to buy a going concern business will, in theory, not be subject to this possibility? That's the intention of Clause uh, 85, is that uh, financial indicator covenants will not form part of standard form loans. All right. I want to move then to another topic, which is RCD.999.0043.0010, which is the relevant regulatory guide. <laughs> This, is this RG183? Yes, that's right. I don't you believe I have a hard copy, but that's okay. I'll, I'll, I just wanted to, if we 
that's definitely not the right one. It's <laughs> rcd.quadruple9.0043.0010. I mean, I say that actually, I don't, whether Suncorp's now publishing ASIC's <laughs> regulatory guide, I, I assume not. There we go. Can we go to dot zero zero two six? So what I'm interested in is the regulatory guide sets out a minimum in relation to remedies for code breaches and A is compensation for any direct financial loss or damage caused to an individual by the breach of the, by the, breach of the code and B is the ability to make non-monetary orders obliging the subscriber to take a particular cause of action to resolve the breach. If we then go back to the draft code and bring up ABA.001.008.0474. And we might need to bring up page 36 and also page 35. So this is the section of the draft code that's setting out the powers and roles and responsibilities of the BCCC. Mm -hmm. and, it is. And the BCCC is to replace the CCMC. That's so, correct. And clause 214 provides for certain powers or sanctions of the BCCC. What I'm, and it, it does provide for uh, the for certain powers that the BCCC has to apply sanctions in the event of a breach of the code if the breach is serious or systemic. What I'm interested in understanding is how does the ABA see the requirement under the regulatory guide of the provision for compensation for any direct financial loss or damage caused by a breach of the code being addressed within the code. Okay. Uh, I think it's important to distinguish here between the BCCC, uh, which is not a complaint handling body. Uh, it is charged with the responsibility of monitoring bank compliance uh, with the uh, code. The code itself is establishes, requires uh, member banks to be uh, members and to fund uh, an external dispute resolution procedure. That is, was, FOS, will be AFCA. Uh, and it is that body which establishes a customer's right to remedy, compensation uh, and other, and the relevant provisions of RG183. I understand. So the the position of the ABA is that requirement of the regulatory guide is met by the requirement that the bank be effectively yes. a member or a subscriber to an external dispute resolution service, which, yes. as we know, it was FOS, it's going to be AFCA. AFCA has the power to order compensation for a breach and therefore that ought to address the requirements of the regulatory guide. Is That's that right? correct. And then... The last thing that I wanted to ask you about was the situation in relation to ASIC and the negotiation. Does it remain the priority of the ABA to achieve approval of the code by ASIC? Yes. All right. And In terms of resolving this issue about the $5 million or $3 million cap, ASIC's position has been that it ought to be $5 million in the past. Correct. And how does the ABA see that as being an issue that can be resolved with ASIC in order to get approval of the code? In, uh, I think it was mid-April, uh, the uh, a number of banks representing 
particularly the major, the banks major, mostly involved, uh, those banks that have business lending books, uh, met with ASIC and took them through their concerns about the thresholds. Uh, they then resolved to uh, escalate that to the chair of ASIC with a letter that outlined in writing the concerns of the industry and that letter has been provided. Uh, the um, ASIC uh, has not, well, I've acknowledged the letter, but they have not yet formally responded to the issues that have been raised in it. Uh, and I would expect that, uh, sorry, and ASIC has indicated uh, to the ABA and the industry that they believed it was appropriate uh, to delay further consideration of this issue until after the small business hearings had been conducted uh, on the view that there may well be issues raised in these hearings uh, that should be considered by both parties uh, before finalising any provisions on the code, whether it's the three to five or anything else, and, uh, and also out of general caution that this these are matters on which both parties would be required potentially to give evidence. So uh, uh, once these hearings are concluded, I would expect uh, that there will be um, further meetings. Um, I have a meeting with ASIC next week, but I would expect it will be escalated uh, at some point to the chairs of the respective organisations. I should clarify that the discussions at, with ASIC have been held at... Um, at officer level and with the um, with one of the deputy commissioner with the deputy commissioner, ASIC itself as a commission have yet to formally uh, resolve their position. Um, these have all been matters um, appropriately in line with RG 183 uh, that ASIC, after speaking to stakeholders, have put back to the industry for some consideration or reconsideration in the interests of trying to get the best code. There is this one issue uh, that is yet to be resolved and uh, I look forward to those discussions in the next couple of weeks. Commissioner, I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Ms. Mr Blair. Hodge. Does any party having leave to appear seek leave to cross-examine Ms Bly? No? Very well. Mr Silver, have you anything rising? Ms Bly, thank you for your evidence and your attendance. You, uh, you. may step down and you're excused.